fucking Smetty here. Tom Brady needs to stop making everything about himself, am I right? And welcome to another edition of Golik and Smetty. I am Mike Golik Sr. She is Jessica Smetana. And Jess, I feel almost like I need to start off every one of our episodes with what did J- Jess bake last? Mm, because the last game. last episode, it was, it was a key lime loaf, which I still can't fully say without my mouth starting mm-hmm. to water because I've had key lime pie. But I saw this key lime loaf, and then when you were pouring the the icing over the top, mm-hmm. I, I about lost it. Now I saw you were making, I don't know what it was, but I saw walnut. Was it walnuts? I believe Pecans, it? yeah. Pecans. So the, the key lime yeah. loaf, yeah, that was two loaves ago. So I've made two loaves since then. I made a blueberry streusel loaf, and then yesterday Ugh. I had the day off, so I made a blueberry pecan crunch cake. It oh, is crunch cake. Really good, if I do say so myself. I think... I think this is my best bake of the month so far. The the blueberry crunch cake. Yeah, it's phenomenal. So, so so give me why is it a what makes it a crunch cake? So there's like chopped up pecans and uh, crunchy like turbinado sugar sprinkled on top. So it's like the the top of it just tastes like sugar like pecans like candy like pralines almost. And then the cake itself is like really really just moist blueberries kind of pop in your mouth sugary obviously lots of butter in there uh some some greek yogurt to keep it uh moist yeah it's pretty good yeah i mean listen when you say it's pretty good who is a great baker it's got to be really good and mike i'm very critical of my baking too my boyfriend always makes fun of me because i'll bake something and like midway through i'll be like this is going to be disgusting and then he's always like this is great what are you talking about but i'm very critical about my baking and if i memory serves your boyfriend is not a huge dessert eater not no very weird wow i'm gonna have to have a word um but so you had your day off yesterday so a lot of times you take it into the 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 crew with with Mm -hmm. love yeah this one i already finished it's it's gone i ate the whole cake you ate it all Mm -hmm. good for you it's gone they're not getting any of that that's what i like is when you bake it and you eat it yourself i dig that yeah they they don't get any cake this week love that so now also, I'm going to do a little bit of, of, of promoting because you are involved in this. You're coming to the golf tournament uh, this I weekend, I am. Correct? Very excited. Maybe I'll bring some cake with me, some cookies. Oh, my We'll see. We'll see. We'll God. see if I have time. But so, it so is again, in the works. Our, our, our Golic family, we started a Golic uh, Family Foundation, and our first golf tournament is uh, this Sunday and Monday. Sunday night is the party. Monday uh, we will play. So it's the 26th, 27th. It's at the Warren Golf Course at Notre Dame. A lot of former Notre Dame players coming. Um, also, some Olympians, Michael Ruzioni from the 80 uh, USA Hockey Olympic team. I will be there as well. Brady Quinn and uh, others. And me for there. some reason. And Jess will be there as well, golfing with her dad. I'm very yeah. happy that worked out. Mike, I feel so bad for the the person who's uh, paying to golf with a Notre Dame celebrity, thinks they're going to end up with Brady Quinn, and then they're just playing with me and my dad. You know when they're not going to feel bad, Jess? When you <laughs> smoke a drive and you're playing your drive on every hole in the scramble. Uh, we'll we'll see about that. I don't know if that's going to happen, but Just I'm excited. Stop it. Like I'm Dude, excited. Listen, it's our first one. We, you know what? You know, we wanted to bring people who we liked, who are nice people, who will treat the other the the people that the paying customers. Right. We'll treat them nicely. So. So you I, invited I, my dad. I got it. I, I think. <laughs> I think we will have a very very nice nice group there. I think it'll be a lot of fun. But one of the things we're doing, obviously, at these things, it's about raising money. Uh, We have four charities in South Bend. uh, That's the surrounding city around Notre Dame, for those who may not know. Uh, The Logan Center, uh, the Center for the Homeless, the Northern Indiana Food Bank, and the uh, Animal Shelter in South Bend are the four uh, places we are raising money for. So it it is about raising money. And what we're going to do, Jess, one of the things is we all know how these work. There's a silent auction and a live auction, and we have a lot of great items. But what we're going to do with the silent auction, and, and because of podcast and when you listen, I'll just give the date. That it, it will start June 22nd and go until the, the tournament goes, the 26th or probably the 27th. I'm not sure what day it's ending, but we'll have that up there. We are putting many of the silent auction items online. 
So the people who are not, obviously everybody can't come to this tournament, but there will be available online, the silent auction items. It's at golicsubparclassic.com on Golic Subpar, at Golic Subpar is our Twitter as well. We'll have it all over our, our Twitter handles and stuff, but golicsubparclassic.com starting June 22nd, we'll have a bunch of silent auction items that anybody can bid on. Uh, so we're, we're, and we hope we raise a lot of money and some really, really good stuff. Like one of the things I'll say right now is tickets to the Notre Dame BYU Shamrock Classic are going to be hard to come by in yes. Vegas. So you get two tickets to that game and a three night stay at the MGM Grand. Wow, that's so, a pretty solid one. Yeah, that's a are you, solid Mike, are you going to be going to that game? Oh, I know. hell yes. Okay. You'll, you'll find me before the game at the blackjack table. <laughs> Another silent auction item is Notre Dame opens up at Ohio State. College game day will be there. You will get a behind the scenes tour of college game day. Wow, these are really, yeah. really solid silent auction yeah. items. Yeah, that's, that's just two. There are a bunch. Uh, so again, June 22nd, it'll go up till I uh, probably the 26th or 27th. Again, it'll, it'll, it'll say on, on the website, uh, as well. And you'll see it on Twitter. So very, very excited about that. Great to see you. And boy, if there's some sort of cake or loaf in your hand, wow, <laughs> wow. That would be, uh, uh, awesome. Now um, I feel like if I forget, I'm going to have to go to Martin's and just I, oh, buy, yeah. buy something at the bakery exactly. and pretend I made it myself. Take, and, and you know what? <laughs> I would believe it too. Cause because the, the baker that you are along those lines at the end of the, of this pod, just this kind of the way it worked out. I'm, I'm staying at my place at Notre Dame right now. And my son, Mike is out here. You know, he's uh, does his DraftKings uh, daily podcast, Gojo it's called. Um, he's here as well through the week for the golf tournament. So we were able to go sit in with Marcus Freeman for about a half hour and chat with him. So it was just Mike and I uh, that did that. So at the end of this podcast, we'll play that interview that Mike and I did. And, and certainly Gojo, his podcast is out every day. He'll play it on his as well. So we have that after. Sorry, Jess, you weren't able to be a part of that. I do apologize. I am very bummed about it. But maybe Marcus Freeman will make an appearance at the golf outing. And Marcus Freeman, Sunday night, will be at the party. Oh, so you will see him okay. there, yes. And I'll just say this. Marcus Freeman has one of the best candy dish assortments really? in his office. What's what's in it? Is this part of the interview? Am I spoiling it? It, it is not. So I okay, will tell, tell you, I, it should have been Starburst. And this is all his wife's doing. Starbursts, um, Jolly Ranchers, and then the really like the chocolate balls that are wrapped real fancy. The, like, oh, the really... Lindt truffles. Yes, yes, like those. Okay, yes. that saves it because I don't like Starburst or Jolly Ranchers, so I was about to dispute him having the best candy and, dish ever. And Mar Marcus is the other way; he's not a big chocolate guy. Huh? He's a huge Starburst guy, and it's only the red and pink Starburst because those are his favorite ones. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And I mean, so they yes. just throw away all the yellows or just, I, I, I'm sure the kids got, he's got six kids. He's got six kids. So yeah. I'm sure the kids ate them, <laughs> but, and just these dishes, I mean, they're not dishes, they're bowls. I mean, and he doesn't eat a lot of it. He's a dude. He's in really, really good shape. Uh, but man, I, I had my share. Let me just say that. <laughs> I, I wouldn't leave in there empty handed. There was no way that was going to happen. That's a great scoop, Mike. I yeah, hope well, we get aggregated. Well, see, that, there. I, I don't know what that means, yes, but I hope we do too, since it sounds like it's a good thing, whatever aggregated is. <laughs> as long as it's not agitated, which is, it wouldn't be a good thing. Uh, Mike, I'm excited to hear the interview. Hopefully, hopefully he addresses some of his uh, controversial he does. misquotes, he does. quote unquote he, misquotes that were in the does. news. He does. He did, and he was very forthright with it. You know, okay. he, 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 it, yeah. So it was, uh, he's, like I said, I've talked to him a bunch since he's been hired. I talked to him when he went to hired there as a decor. He's a very, very nice guy. And, and again, we'll see what happens from a head coach. But everybody always asked me, I said this before too, Jess, you know, when there were what, seven new NFL coaches last year, all first time NFL coaches. Mm -hmm. And I say that because, um, Urban Meyer wasn't a first time coach, but he was a head coach, but he was a first time NFL head coach. And that and worked out really well yeah. for him. <laughs> But people always say, oh, how are they going to do? And I would say, I don't know. These were coordinators who become head coaches. You have no idea. Some of the best coordinators, the best defensive coordinator I ever had, and one of the best ever was Bud Carson, the architect of the steel curtain of the Steelers way back when. <laughs> I mean, he, he was phenomenal way before your time, you obviously. You really aging yourself. But I know. I, but, I, I get the point. <laughs> but he was my coordinator in Philly, the best I've ever had. 
And he had a stint as a head coach and he, and he wasn't good at it. He even said, I'm a better coordinator. So I have no, and you have no idea how coordinators are going to be when they have no head coaching experience. So we all hope it goes well as Notre Dame alum, but you know, we will just, uh, we'll have to wait and see. So we'll play that. We'll play that interview in a little bit. A lot kind of going on, just kind of going on now, just in the world of sports. We can, oh, let, let's start with it with a fun guy, Gronk announcing his retirement. Mm. Gronk announced his retirement and almost immediately his agent, which why is his, why is his name just, oh, this is going to kill me. The, he was the, the guy down in Miami who Drew repped Rosenhaus. all of Miami. Yeah, Drew Rosenhaus. Drew Ro Rosenhaus almost immediately came out and said, you know, that if Tom Brady wants him back in the middle of the season or something, he'd probably come back. This what, is going to be like a Tom Brady retirement. I, I mean, mean, it's a retirement. That's not a retirement. That was going to be my my whole bit, Mike, was that when Tom Brady leaves and goes to the Dolphins next year, Gronk's just going to come back after a year off and join the Dolphins now. They're just going to do the whole thing all over again further south. I don't like fool me once. Shame on me. Whatever that expression is, I already screwed it up because it's hard to remember. Yeah. <laughs> do you think you think he's going to Miami next year? No, I don't know. I mean, that's like the whole Stu Gatz conspiracy theory. Right, right. I but I, 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 could believe, I would believe, Mike, I would believe anything. I, who who knows, really? I'm, Tom Brady will – I don't want to predict he's going to retire ever because he has just continued to prove everyone wrong and make everyone look stupid. I never thought he would leave New England, and he made me look stupid for saying yep. that. So uh, I agree. Who knows? I agree. But Gronk, you know, he's 33. He's obviously already retired. He's had to take time off. He's been injured so many times because he's just such a physical player. Probably top best tight end of all time, at least like top two, top three. Yeah. Um, who knows what another off season or year off might do in terms of him wanting to come back and play again. Like we've seen tight ends play, you know, late into their thirties and in, in limited roles before. I mean, look at J Jason Witten coming back. Yeah. I, I don't even remember how old he was when he came back for that one season with the Cow or two seasons, I think with the Cowboys. And then I think he was on the Raiders, right? Just yeah, I think so. Like yeah. Yeah. One, one, one pass every five weeks. So I don't know. It's a position where you can kind of still do that later on in your career so i don't know who who knows what he's gonna do i i think if he, if he does come back it'll be either during the season or if tampa bay makes the playoffs because i i covered that game when they played the rams the rams and the bucks in in the in the, in the divisional round last year and up close i mean you and you're right he's in the team picture of greatest tight ends of all time but i mean he kind of runs like the tin man now he's just mm -hmm. he has been so beat up over the years, just as you said, you're hundred percent right. He's a very physical player that he's probably looking for the least amount of playing time as possible if he is going to come back and play, but I'm with you. I have no idea because God I mean, knows and, he could just go throw another party. Who knows? Right. Well, we don't know what he's going to do. Cause I don't, I doubt he knows what he wants to do either. And like all of this, this equation could change if it means getting, you know, a, a nice decent salary to live in Miami, catch a couple balls from your, your friend, Tom yeah. and, Maybe win another Super Bowl. Who the hell knows? So I don't know. We'll see what happens. But if this is the end for Gronk, it's it's been a it's been fun watching him. He's a interesting, fun guy who enjoys partying, dancing, uh, having his his little beach parties. I guess like I I haven't been to one, but my my friend Charlotte Wilder has yeah come several right. They look like a good time. Um. So yeah, it, he will he will be sorely missed. <laughs> uh, no doubt he will stay in the news somehow, some way, in some side of party a atmosphere. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. A couple of more notes in the NFL. One, one, one not, not obviously humorous at all. The other kind of, I guess, where we are in the world with cryptocurrency. We see it's being just getting destroyed, right, as, as like all, mm -hmm. everything on Wall Street is. Did you see Trevor Lawrence? I did see that, Mike. I haven't verified that that is like true or not. Have you? Because I it, apparently he got his his whole rookie salary paid to him in crypto, which the market tanked. So last it was his it was his signing bonus of twenty two million dollars. Supposedly Oof. he put everything in crypto, and he has supposedly lost sixty percent of that. Now again, you're when you're making that kind of money, you're in for the long game. So he's just going to hang on to it, but. I mean, listen, I have some I have some crypto stuff as well that's getting destroyed, but you know, you don't think about touching it right now. But his entire twenty-two million dollar signing bonus, now that's the word, 
that he put it all in the crypto and he, he's getting he was getting smoked. Could you imagine? But that's just no. that's a portfolio you just don't want to look at. I, I can't imagine having a $22 million. Yeah, how about it? So, no, yeah. I can't imagine investing it in something as volatile as cryptocurrency in the year of our Lord 2021. But my, my last I, year in the oh, NFL, God. 1993, I signed with the Dolphins. I got a $50,000 signing bonus and thought I was the richest guy in the face of the earth. <laughs> God. 22 mil. Uh, uh, hopefully so, you didn't buy yeah. stock in like Enron or something. No, no. Here's <laughs> an interesting thing, though. I had a very good friend of mine who was in upper management in Cisco. And this was like in the late 80s. And we were playing a game out in San Francisco. And I had dinner with him before. And he's like, hey, Mike, if you got, you know, this company and, you know, it's doing pretty well. Why don't you throw some throw 50 grand in it? And I, this was the kind of the beginning of my career. I wasn't even making six figures at this mm -hmm. point. My first salary was 62,000, you know, as a 10th rounder in 1985. So I wasn't making a lot of money. It turned out about six, seven years later, if I had invested $50,000, it would have been worth over $4 million. And I didn't pull the trigger. Well, Mike, stories like that are why Trevor Lawrence and other people yeah. invest their money in crypto because they're all they all think they're going to be the guy who yep. guesses Hits right it. and gets yep. the, you know, massive exponential growth on their investment. So Ugh. I I hope this isn't true, but if it is, like I I hope he makes it back somehow because that is just brutal. Yeah, he's going to have to he's going to have to wait a while for that one. Uh, and then the other NFL news is, you know, a story we we've talked about, a story that's been around, it's been it's about Deshaun Watson. Um, and the fact that of the 24 civil suits out there, 20 have now been settled. Mm -hmm. um, and his, uh, the lawyer for the women said that those lawsuits will be, civil suits will be dropped once the paperwork is complete. So 20 of the 24 have been settled. But just even though that has happened and we don't know the amounts, we don't know what the settlement was, mm -hmm. we, do, we do understand that we believe it will have zero effect on what the NFL still plans to do to Deshaun Watson. Yeah, that's right. I, I still don't really know what how this is going to play out. I mean, he has this contract set up so that if he's suspended for a year, he's still going to make a big payday. And it seems like um, I, I, I don't have any inside information, but it seems like a lot of people expect he will get a big suspension. So uh, it's it's newsworthy that 20 of this of the cases have been settled but there's still four which is a lot of civil suits i think like the number the sheer number that there were 24 to begin with makes you feel like you know four is a small number by comparison yeah. but that's yeah, but still like there's it's not there's still a long way to go with this i don't know what is going to happen with him this season and it seems like you know the fact that there's still four you know open cases means that it's it's doesn't seem like it's going to end anytime soon. Um, because if you're not settling, I guess maybe these four accusers want to go to trial. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm blatantly speculating now, but uh, it's obviously far from being over. Yeah, it, it definitely is. I, I, I think he's going to be gone for at least eight games, maybe the season, um, because we've seen guys get suspended for more with an issue with one woman. And this has been obviously m multiple, multiple women. And still waiting on the NFL, you know, does it start out on the exempt list, you know, where he's not getting paid where, where he's, you know, cause we always see in other companies and sometimes suspended with pay. Well, mm -hmm. if you go on the commissioner's list, um, you are suspended and you're not getting paid. Remember last year I did the game where, uh, was, was a Tyrod Taylor got hurt, um, and the big question was, it was against Carolina. It was early in the season. And the big question was, are they going to play Deshaun Watson? Right. And the answer was decided decisively no. You know, he wasn't even practicing with the team, but he got mm -hmm. paid all year. But right. if he went on the commissioner's list, he would not get paid. So will they do that first? Will they suspend them first? We will still wait and see. But the latest news is that 20 of the 24 women have settled uh, their civil case with Deshaun Watson. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, a couple of other things before we get to the interview. Uh, it seems that, you know, we've talked about the Saudi Arabian League live and them starting up and paying Dustin Johnson 125 million and Phil Mickelson mm -hmm. 200 million. That first tournament went off. Charles Schwartzel won it, won 
between the individual and team. Part of it won $4.75 million for three days work. Uh, now we hear a couple of more golfers from the PGA Tour have gone. Abe Answer, who not a huge name. And if people say not a needle mover, they need needle movers. Mm -hmm. uh, but we know Bryson De De DeChambeau has gone over to live. And now Brooks Kepka mm -hmm. has left to go to live. Brooks Kepka's brother are, is already with Liv. So Brooks Kepka, Kepka went as well. So that's another one gone. That certainly is a name. And Jess, did, did you see that the PGA Tour is now looking to change up their tour schedule? They're mm -hmm. looking to add some, some tour dates and also add tournaments where there's no cuts and the prize total prize package for those tournaments is $20 million, mm -hmm. which is a lot like what Liv is doing. No cuts, everybody gets paid and $20 million purses. So it seems whether, I don't know if people really believe it was Phil Mickelson's true want to go to Liv <laughs> to say, I want to help the other golfers. Right. I don't know if people are really buying that. And for those that aren't watching this on YouTube, I was doing air quotes. Um, I don't know if that was his reason, but it does seem to be affecting the way the PGA is doing business now. Yeah, well, I don't know why they didn't start doing any of this from the start. Because they like weren't forced, Jess. They weren't forced. I mean, even even like the existential threat of this new league starting could have been a, a great opportunity for them to make some more drastic changes because they just, this might be, you know, too little too late. I don't know if those golfers are going to come back to the tour now. I'm not really sure. Um, we don't know yet how long this suspension is that the PGA tour right. emailed all the golfers about before the U S open. So I don't know. It just, it, you know, it's like what we talked about last weekend. There was a very legitimate opportunity for the PGA tour to like hear some of the concerns from from their stars as they were making them instead of, you know, being so reactionary and now having this massive, you know, PR, not, yeah, not even just a PR crisis, but like a, a legitimate existential threat to the tour. Um, but I guess we'll see what happens. Uh, I guess change, some changes is, is good for them, for the golfers that are staying behind, but is, yeah, it, yeah. is it too little too late? I don't, I don't know. Probably, but yeah, but yeah, you're in those no cuts. It means you. I mean, they said that what the last place person at the the live first tournament made one hundred and twenty thousand dollars for finishing dead last, and now the PGA may be picking up some of those types of tournaments. So interesting. So again, Dustin Johnson, Phil Mickelson, Bryson DeChambeau, Patrick Reed, um, and now Brooks Kepka, mm -hmm. all with live. Colin Morikawa was rumored to be going the great young player. Um, and he has stayed, he's, and he even went on Twitter to state for the record. Once again, you all are absolutely wrong. I've said it since February at Riviera. I'm here to stay on the PGA tour and nothing has changed. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got some cereal to pour in my milk. I don't know why, you know, I don't know where that came from, but, uh, I usually pour milk that, in my cereal. That's what I do as well. Yeah. Maybe there's some deeper meaning to that, that, <laughs> that only you young, cool kids know. I don't, I don't know, but, uh, so we'll see if there's more names. You, you've got to know that the live, uh, uh, like Greg Norman is calling guys every week. Right. I mean, trying to get the top guys from the PGA tour, try to money whip them. To yeah. Come over, I mean, so. I think Brooks Kepka is a pretty big name, but again, he's like someone who's been injured a lot. He hasn't right. played. I mean, he won four majors, but he hasn't played very well. So he's someone that like, I, I could see why he would want the automatic payouts if he's if he's unsure maybe about his own health status um and he's also someone who's been i think in favor of of shorter seasons and and like talked about you know just how long and and brutal and boring <laughs> the tour can be yes. at times but yeah. um but he is he is like you said a really really big name so uh yeah things continue to develop on that front and then lastly, before we get to the Marcus uh, Freeman interview, I always love talking with you. And I know you have you started a pod now uh, with DraftKings for uh, Formula One for F1. So uh, the Canadian Grand Prix was this week for Stappen. There he is again with the win, but probably one of the biggest changes this time around Lewis Hamilton makes it to the podium. Yeah, which was uh, really exciting to see, Mike. But again, people who are sick of seeing the same 
cars doing well, probably we're not excited to see a, a, another Mercedes on the podium driven by Lewis Hamilton. But yeah, Max Verstappen's like really good. Like this season, I don't, I hope it's not over, but he has been just unflappable in the last few That's races. six wins, like, right? Six, six wins, I think, this year? Yes. In that he, area there? He, the only, I think the only races that he hasn't won or, or been on the podium for were ones where his car like broke down. And then right. in, in Monaco, he came in third. Uh, and his teammate won, but he's just been, he's just been so good. And he clearly has the best car, uh, on the grid. So I don't know. I hope that there's still an interesting title race and, and like, he doesn't run away with it, but he's taken a commanding lead now. Um, and basically the, the Ferraris and like Charles, Charles Leclerc had to start at the back of the grid. Cause he had right. to. You know, there's all these rules where if you have like a certain amount of engines in a season, you have to take penalties and stuff like that. So, you know, he finished in fifth, but hopefully the Ferraris will be able to put up more of a fight uh, down the stretch. But I don't know, Verstappen has just been so good. So, so let me ask you this for someone you have been into this for a while. I'm getting into it more and more. I watched the Drive to Survive series in about two days, four seasons of it, and it's a lot. It's even more fun now to watch now that you know some of the characters involved. Mm -hmm. But as the sport, and, and by the way, TV rights could be up for this thing. So, I mean, oh, yeah. all of a sudden, there's going to be, you know, uh, instead of ESPN just taking, what, the Skynet feed, basically? Sky Sports, yeah. Sky Sports, Skynet, what am I thinking, a Terminator or whatever. Uh, Sky <laughs> Sports. I don't even so, know the reference. Yeah, I know. So, yeah, geez, there we go again. Sorry. Yeah, good age difference. No, 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 not your fault. Um, but uh, so that that will be interesting down the road. But for a sport that's going to try and even grab more of a foothold here, we've had obviously races in Austin and Miami going to have them in Vegas mm -hmm. and to try and grow even more in the U.S. Does it hurt it that it, it was Lewis Hamilton for what, seven or eight years? Yeah. It was it was Mercedes for seven or eight years. You know, and now it's for Stappen, you know, winning all the time. And you see, as you mentioned, the same three, four, five guys up near the top where you are and, and the grid to start, you know, the pole mm -hmm. or what role, how close you are to the front mm -hmm. usually means you're going to be there. Does that overall hurt the excitement of the sport? I'm not sure if it does. I mean, I, I've only been following for a couple seasons and the whole reason for, for the rule regulation going into this season was that. Um, the FIA decided that they wanted to even the playing fields a little bit because Mercedes had been so dominant for so long and there was, right. you know, maybe waning interest uh, about knowing who the champion was going to be before the season even started because Mercedes just had massive investment in their car and a massive advantage to the other drivers. But I mean, to me, at least in this race at, in, in Montreal, the Canadian Grand Prix this weekend, it was still really exciting despite, uh, you know, even not paying attention to the title chase like the last 15 laps uh, there was a chance that carlos Sainz, who drives the ferrari was going to be able to catch up to verstappen and he wasn't but there was still aside from that so many you know funny and interesting things that happened and i think a lot of like real like true fans of the sport are just as interested in the rest of the grid than they are like the top two or three cars and, and the top two drivers. So it remains, remains to be seen like what the new fans, I guess, really care about and what they're interested in. But I still think that the reason that the sport has become so popular in the States is because people really like all of the different characters. Um, yeah. And those things are still very much in play, even if you know, you know, who, who's going to win a race. So I guess it, it remains to be seen how, you know, Verstappen, like it, it, anything can happen the rest of the season. They've had to retire their car twice this season, too. Right, right. His car specifically, and, and Red Bull had issues this weekend, too. So uh, who knows what's going to happen, but, you know, he's really, really good. And I don't think that he's the only reason people watch. And I don't think people just watch because they want their guy to win. Um, because if you're not a, a Verstappen fan or, or a Charles Leclerc fan, you wouldn't have been watching the season anyway. So I, I guess we'll see. It's right now, uh, Verstappen, uh, as far as the driver standings, 175 points, his teammate, <laughs> Checo has 129 and then Leclerc mm -hmm. has 120, what, 126, I think. Yeah. So, um, you know, as Leclerc said, it's motivation where, where, uh, Verstappen is, uh, right now. So uh, we'll see where that goes as far as uh, the constructor. I'm, where are we at? Red Bull. 
A Red Bull is winning that Ferrari second. Mercedes is third. Red Bull has a pretty commanding lead mm -hmm. on that one. A lot of races to go, though, so we have a ways to go. I, I'm with you that even though those guys are winning, you're, you're watching because you're a fan of the sport and a fan mm -hmm. of those guys. And, and you're right. Anything can happen. I mean, uh, God knows when a car is going to porpoise on a straightaway, right? <laughs> oh, my God. So true, Mike. Look, <laughs> I still watch college football, even though I know Alabama is going to win every year. So, well, it is well, what it is. <laughs> well played. Well played. All right. So uh, um, coming up now, we're, we're going to go again. I'm sorry you weren't able to be part of it, but we do want everybody to hear uh, the interview with uh, Notre Dame head coach Marcus Freeman. Again, my son, Mike. And I were able to sit in uh, in his office for about a half hour and just chat with him. Uh, obviously, talk about what went on, you know, with the Ohio State Bulls, but so much more. First time head coach and great recruiter, and just what each of these firsts have been for him: his first winter workouts, his first spring ball, his first summer workouts, which are going on now, leading into his first August camp. You know, as a head coach, there's a lot of firsts for him going on. So it was a uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, to sit down and chat with them as uh, as we're finishing up summer workouts. And you stole some lint truffles. Yes, I did. God, they were good. All right, excited to be here in the flesh, South Bend, Indiana, with Notre Dame head football coach Marcus Freeman. So, Coach, first and foremost, thanks for giving us the time and letting us come and set up equipment in your very nice office. <laughs> Absolutely, man. This is home. You guys, listen, you guys help build this place, so this is your home, too. Um, unless the door's shut, you're not allowed in here. Yeah, there we go. Fair, <laughs> fair enough. Also, we had the option to set up outside on your balcony and – as we know, June in South Bend or anywhere in the Midwest, a little spicy out here. Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, I don't know if we should be sweating on the middle of this podcast, yeah, yeah. but um, maybe next week we can redo it and the weather's a little bit not <laughs> so hot. It. Yeah, because again, if any recruits are listening, it's beautiful in South Bend all of the <laughs> all time. All the time. All, all the time. time is yeah. what we've often said around here. But uh, Coach, this feels like one of the rare times where I see you not moving or talking to someone or shaking <laughs> someone's hand. So... Uh, what does free time look like for Marcus Freeman at this point? Because it doesn't seem like there's been a lot of it. We've seen you at a couple of different stops along the way this summer. Your you know recruiting trail prowess so far has been noted by everybody. But what do you do when you have a free moment? Well, I think you have to make free time, and because there's always something to do. There's all I have a, a to do list, and it, it just. It's long. It's pages long. And so you have to create free time. And for me, free time would be to be with the kids and my wife. And, and you got to try to be intentional about spending time with your family, especially when you have those little kids like we do. But um, this place keeps you pretty busy, you know, so there's not much free time available. <laughs> yeah, I, I would not imagine. So and, and with the amount of kids, well, we're talking six kids. There's a there's a yeah. lot of lot of loving to go around. So how much is your wife involved in, in taking care of that that time? You know, when when you have that free time about what you're going to do. Yeah, it's it's interesting, you know, because she wants her time too, you know, and uh, but it's a blend. I always say it's a blend. So if she can bring the kids in the office for for an hour for twenty minutes, she does. And so half the time the kids run to my door and say, "Hey, dad," and go to everybody else's office. Yeah. But it's still a chance to see them. And and but when we're home, um, you know, we just try to do things together, you know, and and maybe go out to eat together. But then she'll want to leave the kids at home and let the oldest baby sit so we can have our own time. There you go. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Uh, <laughs> Coach, it, it, one of the other things that as we've gone in and now, you know, a full year into this as the coordinator, now in your first year as head coach, the one thing, whether it's been alumni, whether it's been other coaches that I've heard about you is when you're talking to people and people that have been around this university or people that have meant a lot to this place, you're always coming in with a lot of questions that you're asking. You're always trying to get a lot of information around people. Was was that something that, you know, has always been the way that you've approached things? Was that something that, you know, you learned from someone about taking on this job as head coach? Why has that been the way you've approached so much of your first year here as the head coach? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with what you tell your players. And we tell our players all the time to seek feedback, right? Seek feedback. And you got to believe the feedback. That's the only way to grow. But how often do we as coaches truly do that? But I, that's how I want to grow, right? And you have to be vulnerable. You have to be able to say, listen, I want your ideas. I want to see is there a better way to do what we're doing. And because you have so many valuable minds around that staff table in this football program. And so I'm not the leader that wants to say that I have all the answers. 
I want to put people around me that have strengths, maybe where I have weaknesses. And so those, that feedback is great for me to create ideas. But ultimately, being a head coach, you got to make decisions, right? And that's something that I understand. But I love the input. And I've been places before where maybe they say they want feedback, but they really don't, right? I want to make sure our staff understands that I want feedback. I want ideas because that's the only way that we're going to be able to really achieve the results we want. So along those lines, and we, we've talked a couple of times, you know, when you first got the job, when, you know, Jack offered you a job, you took the job, everything was, was going along. And now you've had your first game being a bowl game, your first winter workout, your first spring, your first summer workouts leading into your, your first August. Is there a point where and are you and when did it happen you became comfortable as the head coach of Notre Dame? I think it, it happened kind of over time. I think what I've done is, I mean, the first months or whenever it was, it's just – Oh my, you wake up, you're the head coach of Notre Dame. What are you, what, where are we going? What are we attacking? And then becomes, this is becomes what you do. And you develop a passion and then for really who you want to be as the head coach, right? And, and what is your passion? Mine is, is our players, right? I love our players. I love to see them have a success. I did something really cool last week when I flew to New York with Lou Holton hmm. to see 60, 50, 40 year old grown men hug a coach and tell them, coach, I love you. It's great to see you. That doesn't mean everything during that time period when they're together was great, but they love and respect them. I said, that's what it's about. It's about serving your players, and, and that means being intentional about trying to help them reach your goals. That doesn't mean everything's kumbaya. Right. It means you have standards, you hold them accountable, but you can always tell them you love them because those relationships last forever. And so as I transition, as I move forward being a head coach, I'm starting to develop that, okay, it's about your players. It's about your players and putting them in a, a situation to have success um, as a team. By the way, Luke can tell a story. Can you? Oh, he's strong. I mean, he, he's strong. He is, I mean, <laughs> he is amazing. They they had us both doing a, a fireside chat, and they would ask a question, and he would go first, and uh, they would give me the mic. I said, "Here you go." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm following that. <laughs> yeah. So so uh, again, along with, and I'm always love asking first time head coaches this because that's what you, you you know you wanted to be and you got to be it. Do you then have a list? of coaches that you look to hire, and obviously not every coach is available. C kind of go through that. I'm always intrigued by that process. Well, I would have thought before I became the head coach, when you become the head coach, you just go through your list and you hire the people right. that you know that will do a good job. And for me, that's not the way I wanted to do it. When I became the head coach, the first person I wanted to retain was Tommy Reese. And I, and I wanted to make sure Tommy Reese was our offensive coordinator. Well, in order for Tommy Reese to have success, he has to feel empowered about some of those guys on the side of his ball. And so I, I quickly learned that, hey, you got to empower your coaches and you got to help them have success. And, and part of that was saying, Tommy Reese, here's my expectations for, for people we bring in. Bring me the most qualified guy. Right. I've said I want people that love young people. I want people that are, are going to make our players better in terms of being a football player, but also want great recruiters. And so he was able to bring me the top candidates in his mind. And then I would interview him and say, OK, this is the guy or not. You know, but at some point, sometimes you got to make decisions. Head coach that I'm going to hire this guy in this position because I want him. I know he's the right guy. And I did that before, too. But I don't have a list where I say, hey. If this guy leaves, this guy I'm going to hire. You know, I, I got to really see what is best for the staff. I, I got to ask because he coached Mike Harry Heestand. I mean, had you known him before this, and what what impression? Did you have? He is he is something. It was really really unique with him in that that when we decided to make a change at O line, um, Tommy was a little bit cautious of how hard he pushed for Harry Heestand. I had known here. I didn't know him personally, but right. he was the O-line coach when I was with the Chicago Bears when I was drafted. And so I saw him from afar, but I didn't really know him personally. But Tommy Reese was like, you know, he's the best guy. I think we should interview some guys, but he's the best guy in my opinion. Jack Swarbrick, I'm telling you, Harry, he stands. So Jack said, call somebody. I want you to call somebody. And it was uh, Andy Hett, who's the offensive line coach for the yeah, Chiefs. Kind of pick his mind. And Andy said, if you have a chance, first thing he said, if you have a chance to hire Harry, he stand, then hire Harry, he stand. And I'm like, you talk about a guy that understands O-line play but really cares about his alma mater. When he said that, I said, okay. So I brought Harry in and kind of just, just talked to him, got to know him and let him know my expectations for guys that are on our staff. And he has been an unbelievable addition <laughs> to this coaching staff. Unbelievable. Yeah, and can speak from having played for Harry. And yelled at about him yeah, a lot. Just yeah. one or two times. <laughs> the best part about coming back now is – 
I am no longer the one getting yelled at. I get to watch everyone else get coached by him. So that's a fortunate spot for everyone there. But I remember Coach Eastan telling me that you guys overlapped when he was in Chicago, that yep. you were a player there. And he told me how you stuck out to him even then, just the way that you conducted yourself as a player. How far into your process of being a player did you know you eventually wanted to be a coach? And was that something that you had always carried or was that something that grew over time? Well, I want to first answer that part of, Harry Houston was just being nice. He does not remember me. I promise you that. I wasn't there long enough. He was just being nice. He remembers but... his whole life. That's what he remembers. No yeah. doubt. No yeah. doubt about that. But the second part of that is, is, you know, I always wanted to be an athletic director. I really? did. When I was in college, I wanted to be an athletic director. And I GA'd my last year really for Gene Smith at Ohio State in the athletic department. And then so I get to the NFL, and I realized after my first year, I was with my third team. Right. And, and it's a great story because all of a sudden it's in Hey, Marcus Freeman has an enlarged heart valve. So he decides to get in a coach. Listen, you're on three teams in one year. You're starting to, as we've said before, the, the NFL retires. That's exactly, exactly right. right. I, yeah. I've heard you say that before. And so it kind of hit me that, man, like I'm not ready to be away from the game of football. I don't want to kind of go into administration. I want to stay around the game. So I remember calling Coach Tress saying, I think I want to be a J. He said, oh, I thought you wanted to be an athletic director. I said, no, coach, I want to be around the game. And that's why I got into it, to be around the game of football. Because I thought it was, I loved scheme. I loved the locker room, the guys. Um, and I said, that's why I want to do this. But then all of a sudden, I quickly learned that I got my most satisfaction out of seeing players that I coach succeed. Like you, you give them a tip sheet on a Friday. Or you tell them, hey, if you see this formation, this is going to happen. And I remember a kid had a sack. And I remember saying, that is the greatest feeling for me. And that was why I did it. And that, as I grew in the profession, it continues to be a reminder. It's about the young players. It's about the players seeing them having success. That's why I do it. How much has that vantage point already changed for you, though, being in the head man position now where you go from being in that defensive meeting room every day, getting to be at the head of that room? Have you already seen a shift in how you've had to kind of tailor that experience going through spring and summer? Yeah, you have to pull back a little bit, right? You don't have one the time to be the defensive coordinator, right? You can't you can't give the kids the best possible chance to have success if you're the head coach and you want to try to be the defense coordinator. You can't do that. You have to lean on your staff. But I still want to make sure I take care of the player, right? That's kind of what I've done is pulled back and said, okay, how do you make sure your players are set to have success? Players come to Notre Dame to win national championships. Let's, let's, that, they come to Notre Dame to be a national champion. They also come to Notre Dame to get their degree. And so I want to help them. They also come to Notre Dame to be first-round picks. <laughs> right? That's, that's why they do it. So I want to help them reach those goals. Right? I want to make sure I'm doing everything in my power to put this football program in a position where it can win every game it plays. But ultimately, it's still about the players. It's about helping them reach their goals. So I, I'm interested, though, pulling back, which I get, being a head coach, you have to. But, I mean, you were used to being every day in that room. I mean, you biting a hole through your lip at all? And I don't mean no. watching another coach. Al's, Al's a hell of a coach. Yeah. Al Golden, your new, your new D coordinator. But just that used to be you, and you, yeah. you have to pull back from that. Yeah, you get your – to me, you, you find it in different ways. Right now, I really study situational football. Mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time studying really the last five minutes of halves, last five minutes of games to really kind of say, this is where I want to be an expert at. I spend a lot more time recruiting, you know, and, and developing relationships with these guys we're recruiting. And so I find ways to fill that void that was always in the defensive staff room, always working on game plan in different ways. Um, but – I do miss it. I do miss that part of it for sure. You know, you, you said the word expert. And, and one of the things, I know your defensive scheme. I follow it when you got here, what, how you run it. But also how you're known as a recruiter. And I know there are coaches who coach in college that can't stand that part of it. That they got to go talk to 17 or 18-year-olds and do what they got to do. What makes you love it so much and makes you so good at it? Well, I think, one, you got to love what you're selling. I, I believe in we're selling young people something that nowhere else in the country you can get. You know, truly the, the ability to get the football excellence part of it, to really reach every goal you have in terms of football. But the other side is the educational value of this place and what this place does for young people long after football. And so I believe that I'm selling something that nowhere else can sell. So that's the first part about it. The second part of it is really 
gaining that relationship with those young people. You know, what I want is be able to get the right guys into this place that will have a relationship, I'll have a relationship with for the rest of my life. And so it's about developing relationships, but also selling somebody something that you truly believe in that will help them have success for the longevity of their life. And we know recruiting has also changed a lot. Like it's it really interesting to me, the time you become a head coach in might involve more change than we've seen in the last two decades of college football with the advent of the one-time transfer rule and the portal becoming an option with name, image, and likeness and the NIL th uh, role in college recruiting that we've seen now. For you, I, I want to start with the portal. You guys haven't lost, even in a coaching change. A lot of guys to transfers, a lot of guys in the portal. You've brought in a couple of important guys that will be contributors this year. But how do you feel like going forward programs are going to have to go about player retention? Is that something where you are actively recruiting the guys you're with? Or what is your strategy and thought process on the best way to make sure that Notre Dame is a place that not only guys want to commit to, but the guys want to stay? Yeah, I think you got to continue to educate them on why you chose Notre Dame, right? We, we, I spent a lot of time reminding our players the privilege they have to go to school here. We brought back guest speakers. We, we, I want them to always understand it is a privilege, not just to play football here, but to go to school here. So that understanding in their head doesn't prevent them from going to the portal, but may, might cause some hesitation. You know, and, and then the other part of it is we have to be able to provide the same benefits here at Notre Dame that schools might be trying to provide our players to get them to entice them to leave. You know what, if our players can't benefit off a of name, image, and likeness at Notre Dame as well as they do anywhere else in the country, then we have to be better. But the other part of that is the pull to understanding the education, the educational value, the team value, and hopefully it's relationships with their coaches too. And with the name, image, and likeness portion of this, because we've seen that has become such an outsized part of the discussion around college football, the landscape around this, it is – how do you feel about the path that college is going down right now where this has become such a big part of the recruiting conversation? It's it's changed. It's changing. But I'm not the person at the table that can make the changes to get it to has the right. I don't have the right answer for it because that's not what I spend a lot of time doing. I have to understand what the change um, in college football is happening, you know, and so we have to understand that we have to do what's best for Notre Dame. And to me, I don't know the truth of what other schools are doing, and that's not my concern. I know that at Notre Dame, we have to make sure that when you're at school here, great, you got a chance to benefit off your name, image, likeness, but that's not why you come to Notre Dame, right? You come to Notre Dame because you want to, one, be a part of a winning program. You, gotta, you wanna know that, hey, I'm going to a place that I know we're gonna win. And I'm going to a place that no matter when this football career is over, that I'll have an education that's gonna take care of me long after football. While I do that, I can benefit off a of name, image, likeness. But we would definitely, you, one, you can't, but two, you can't entice people off a of name, image, likeness to come to this place, because you won't make it here. You come here because you understand that, hey, I value education, I value, I wanna be a part of a great football program. So on the other side of that is the player now that you're sitting in the, in the living room of the 18 year old and, and his parents. So this not from your side or the school side. And you know, I, you can't blame players in this day and age because they are allowed to make money now. How soon into a conversation can you get a feel for a guy if he's like, okay, he's, he wants to know what he's gonna make if, if he comes here? Yeah, I'd like to address it myself right away. Okay. You know, that's a part of the conversations when I sit down with these young people and say, hey, here's the benefits of name, image, and likeness at Notre Dame. We have a presentation. Jack Swarbrick has an unbelievable presentation on the Notre, the Notre Dame way of name, image, and likeness. But also, I like to bring it up just so right away there is no confusion on how we do things. You don't need to bring up how much money are you guys offering. We don't. We don't we don't do that and we don't discuss that. Here's how we do things at Notre Dame. Is this something that you want to be a part of? You know, and so I like to put it out there right away. One of the uh, the other things that goes along, obviously, with, with being a head coach is everybody cares what you say now. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the deal with Ohio State, I want to get into actually that actual game down the road that's been put to bed. So forgetting the micro of that, the macro of being a first time head coach and now the feeling of, okay, every single word that you say, you know, can be misconstrued, can be parsed differently. So how, how have you thought about that? Well, you have to be 
smart on the things you say to come out of your mouth. You, you can't give individuals a chance to misquote you. And so it's a great learning experience for me to be, because I'm an authentic guy. I don't want to be a made up person. I don't want to be somebody that's not who I am at the core of my heart and, and be so calculated on everything I say. But there's certain things you, you have to learn from and you can't say things about, you can't even mention other schools' names. You have to be smart in terms of um, what you say, but also how you say it. And so it's still something continue, that continues, I have to continue to get better at. Right. Right. Because authenticity is one thing, but putting your program in a situation that isn't in a good light, that's another thing that I never want to do. And then there's the side of it of it's your alma mater, the, the first game. And so people are going to want to bring that up way earlier than you are going to want to talk about it yeah. because, you know, you just want to get your kids ready for a season. So how do you, you know, everybody's saying, oh, it's your alma mater, you're going to Ohio State mm -hmm. to deal with that kind of excitement, but but temper it. Yeah, I think you, 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 you acknowledge it. Yep, that's our first game of the year, but your focus is just your team. How do we prepare? What's going to be important for this team? And right now, our focus is on preparation and development. We got to prepare this current roster because ultimately, it doesn't matter who we play right now. We got to look at our roster and say, there's a maximum level this talent can get to. Let's push it and develop it to get to this level. Then as we get into game week, we'll study the opponent. We'll know hey, exactly who we play. Here's what we got to do to have success. But it's still about developing this group and getting to the best level, the highest level it can be at. So with that in mind, what does success in year one look like? Because everyone's made note of first-time head coaches that have gotten their start at Notre Dame and the record and all these things, but the situations and the circumstances have all been so different. You walk into a team that you were a part of last year that won double-digit games for the fifth year in a row. You know the makeup of this roster. I said it's so much different from when I was here, when Brian Kelly first got here and we had been winning six games each of the years before and everyone always talks about knowing how to win we were still kind of in the process of learning all of that for you with all that in mind how do you view success in year one for you at this program yeah i don't put a number on it i don't i i, I really focus on the process to to getting to those 12 guaranteed opportunities that we have right and that hey how can we develop this roster develop this roster develop this roster and then those 12 guaranteed opportunities let's play at the highest level we can play at and if that's good enough to win great if it's not, then we got to continue to look at how we develop, how we, we prepare. But that's really where my focus has been is pre preparation and development. They're in summer conditioning right now. They're working their tails off. They'll transition over to football for fall camp. And so that's all about getting this team to get ready to perform at this level. Then you got to go play. You got to go play. You can't worry about it. how many games are we going to win? Are we going to win this first one? It's go play. Are you prepared? If you are, go play. And then guess what? Week two will come. The preparation begins again. Boom, boom, boom. You start preparing, preparing. Then go play. Then week three comes. And then you know what? At the end of the year, we look back and say, okay, here's our record. How have we done? So along those, those lines, you and I have been in college and pro locker rooms, and we've walked into them, and we've seen goal boards, yeah. some more than others. Are you a goal guy, whether offense, defense, you know, having either weekly or yearly goal set? Yeah, we always say our goals here at Notre Dame is win national championships. Right. We I, wanna, I mean, like week to week. Yep. We, we look at different standards that week. Well, I would say this each week we look at, hey, here's the things we believe it's going to take to win. Right. And hey, st st statistical, analytical, all these different things. We need to do this to be able to win. But that can change week to week, depending on who your opponent is. So I love to sit back and, and, and not sit back, but really collaborate with our coordinators and our special teams coordinators. Say, OK, this week, what is it going to take for this team to feel like we if we do these things this week? will be victorious on Saturday. I think one of the one of the misconceptions is this analytics of football. Because hell I know when I was playing our game plan, <laughs> that had analytics in it. Yeah. You know, they've always been around, but I know it's more involved now. Are you an analytics guy? I use it. I use it um, to uh, the degree that it, it can help me and help our team. Um, I'm not a guy that just lives and dies by the analytical book. Um, but I think if there's parts of that that can help us have success, I want to utilize it. And so that's something that it, I used it in the bowl game, right? And it tells you different, it gives you different ideas for, hey, should you go for this? Hey, what's the preparation in terms of, um, you know, what do you have to get to go for it on fourth down? Different scenarios that you could utilize that book. Um, but if it's an asset, if it can help us 
get better, I want to use it. If it's not going to help me or the team and just confuse us, then I stay away from it. Decision science is yep. what I've always heard it referred to best. And we know in football, we're all in the business of trying to make the best decisions possible. You mentioned the bowl game. Now, as you've had a bunch of time removed from that, you're gearing up for the season. You do get to walk into your first year as the head coach with a game under your belt. As you go back and have, I'm sure self-scouted that plenty over the course of this year, are there one or two things from that for you as the head coach that you really took and said, all right, this is going to make me better week one. I know I want to either do what I did in this game or improve on this before we get to week one. Yeah, I think one of the things me and I remember meeting with Coach Reese and we were talking about it for a while. Was there was a play right before halftime. Um, our offense is driving and on first down, we end up throwing an incomplete pass. We end up scoring on that drive, um, which kind of gave you a misconception of dang, maybe we should the book would have told you to run it on first down you know and those are things that we can all learn from and and again defensively right before half is there different things we could have done to not give up a touchdown right before half and so I think we have to use that as feedback we have to use that as as ways to continue to get better and to learn um, and for me it was great to have that experience I really believe I learned a lot from that first game and, and not even just for football but also for moving forward like okay hey, you have to be very intentional by every decision you make so you, you mentioned a couple of places are you one of those guys that can pick out plays 10 years ago that you remember and in, in oh, a game. McVay, mem me uh, McVay I, memory? I mean, that's one of the reasons I don't think I, I, I can't even, I, I have people that watch me play that remember my career better than me. Yeah. Do, you re do you remember plays from well, years I don't ever want to be compared, compared to Sean McVay and his memory. Like he's, <laughs> I hear he is top of the line, but you have those certain plays that stick out to you that, you know, will stick out to you probably for a long time. Yeah. Coach, for you, at this point, you've gone through – obviously, you know this team from last year already. But now, every year, and we heard this plenty as players, all of us, every year is a different team. You've got different people in the locker room, different people that start to take center stage. So, going through winter workouts, spring football, and now into summer workouts, who are the guys that have stuck out to you as leaders already on this team? Guys that you think, all right, I'm going to be able to rely on as the coach to get my message across to the locker room. Well, I think it's really unique where you have two returning captains. Right with Jarrett Patterson and Avery Davis, who were both captains last year that returned back to this team. And so there are naturally those two are natural leaders because they were in a captain position last year. And so, I mean, I, I've seen guys step up. You've seen a guy like Isaiah Foskey and Michael Mayer and, and even, uh, you know, a guy like Jaden Mickey, he's a freshman. You know, leaders don't always have to be the, 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 the appointed captain or a SWAT leader, which we have SWAT teams and, and we have leaders on those uh, different teams. But, you know, it's been good to see everybody hold each other count because I told these guys, being named a captain doesn't mean you're the only people that hold people accountable. We all, every person in this football program is responsible for holding every other person to the standard. If you see somebody that is not doing the things that we say this is the standard, then you're letting that – action be a new standard that's what we say all the time and so everybody in this program is responsible for making sure we all hold each other accountable i mean a thousand percent i've always said you don't have to have the c on your chest to be a leader you absolutely do not 100 percent. so the head coaching aspect again of this through this process to where we are now has there been anything where you where you went oh didn't see that coming <laughs> Ooh, didn't see that coming um there's 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 a lot of first you yeah. know there's a lot of first um that you're learning on the fly. Um, I'm trying to think of an example that I wasn't truly prepared for. You know, I don't have one off the top of my head. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's saying a yeah, lot already. Yeah, that, yeah. that is. How about this then? I always like to know this. The first time you sit in that chair, obviously outside of immediate family, who's one of the first people you called? Jim Trestle. And that's the person I still call to this day. And, and I tell these, these players that I meet with, these recruits, the same thing. Like, that's my head coach forever. You know, right. and, and it's the same thing with our players. I'm going to be your head coach forever. And that's a relationship that I value and, and a person I know will give me an honest opinion, you know, and honest feedback. And, um, you know, there's not many people you can call on that you know you can trust. Um, there's a lot of people that are willing to, to talk to you and give you feedback. But Jim Trestle is a guy that, that I often talk to. And then what other thing I did was I made sure to reach out to every former Notre Dame football head coach that is still living to kind of just pick their brains on terms of what it's like to sit in that chair. You know, there's things that obviously there's a lot of things that I didn't know and uh, that they could give me their advice on. But ultimately, it still comes back to what we talked about at the beginning of the podcast is 
I have to make a decision. I love feedback. I, I seek feedback, but the head coach has to make the final decision. Buck staffs with you. Amen. Uh, well, coach, from a couple of former players who have seen what you've done in bringing players yeah. back around this program and the way you've come and embraced this university, it, it, it's been a really strong start. It's been a lot of fun to watch, and we're looking forward to watching what comes next as we get to the real ball in the season and the part that we know you love the most. So thanks so much for giving us some time, coach. Best of luck. Thank you, guys, man. It's been a blast.